my kitchen family room. Um, it's so wonderful to have uh, this opportunity to cross distance, cross states, even cross the ocean. We have people who've been connecting to us from different countries as well. But I'm really speaking to all of you, but I'm just so delighted to be connecting with the Athens, Georgia group who's been hosting this. We're going to explore tonight some tender questions of the heart, really getting to the essence of, of faith and the deep questions about God that so many of us wrestle with, no matter where we place ourselves on that spectrum of faith, whether we really consider ourselves sincere believers but are wrestling with situations that just don't seem to yield or whether we put ourselves on the other end of that spectrum, really a sense of skepticism and feeling more in tune with Friedrich Nietzsche and his statement, God is dead, which he said over a hundred years ago. Wherever we are on that spectrum, we're all thinkers, and we're here to have a discussion about God, maybe with some fresh perspectives, some fresh insights that I hope all of us can walk away from feeling blessed by. We're going to have four questions really framing this discussion. The first is, what is God? The second question we'll go into is, well, if God is so good, what about evil? And the third question we're going to look at is, what do you mean by prayer? What is it and what does it do? And the fourth question is, why does any of this matter? If you stay with all these questions, you'll see that they're building on one another, but we're inviting questions through the webinar. You can place them in, they'll be coming to me um, live, as well as I've already had some questions from some of you who've signed up in advance. So we're gonna try to weave those in along the way. We're also gonna have some time at the end to go through additional ones. So again, thanks for joining me, and let's jump right into that first question. What is God? You know, one of the tough things is that humanity has had many, many, many definitions of God over many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. You know, if we go way back to ancient civilizations, like, like the Egyptian civilization, we see um, images of their sense of God as being half man and half animal, like some of the other ones that are crocodiles and people and half uh, jackal and half person, and you, you just get this sense that they were wrestling with what is it that was causing all the things going on in their lives. You went across the Mediterranean, you went up to the Greek civilization, you would find them identifying their sense of God in terms of many gods that lived at the top of Mount Olympus, and they were a pretty scary bunch and you really didn't want to cross them because they could create a tremendous amount of havoc in your life. But contemporary with these man-like views of God was the Jewish civilization that was exploring a sense of God in a whole different direction. In fact, their, one of their words for God was the word ruach, which was their word for spirit, for wind, and for breath. And you get this tremendous sense of the invisible nature of God with a powerful and tangible effect on human experience. Just as we can see the leaves rustling and the rustling in the wind, or we can see a boat on the ocean being carried by the wind, we realize that the wind is not in the boat, not in the leaves, but each of these are within the wind. And that's a wonderful way for them to think about each of us as within this invisible power or God. So we'll just maybe start with this idea, asking ourselves, what is God? And starting with this idea of spirit. Well, that's a, a nice starting point. But we live in a very skeptical, materialistic culture. And often I hear, you know, if I can't see it, I can't handle it, it doesn't exist. We have this tremendous sense that our five senses are going to validate whether something is real or not. But this is kind of a, a limiting view in a scientific world. Many of us remember learning about the spectrum of light, you know, maybe back in middle school, 
And you know, that spectrum of light just stretches right out there. And what part of it is visible light? You know, it's that tiny, tiny little part there. So much light exists beyond what we can see. We have ultraviolet and infrared and um, electromagnetic and microwave. Well, I may not be able to see a microwave with my eyes, but if I take some chips and add some cheese into it and stick it in my microwave oven, turn it on, about 30 seconds I'm going to have a tasty little snack. Not because I can see that light, but I can see the effect of it. Now, if something has an effect, it must start with a cause. And, you know, cause is a great way to think about this discussion, what is God? In fact, if you start going back to the Bible, you can use that word cause and begin to get a different sense of what some familiar ideas mean to you. Now, a lot of people give me pushback on this wonderful book, the Bible. I hear, often hear it's an old book. What, what does it have to say to us today? Well, I look at it as being 2,000 years of time-tested wisdom, where people were really wrestling with the great questions about what is important, what is valuable, what endures, and they often revolve around our understanding of what God is. So, if we begin to look through this and get some of this time-tested wisdom and use that word cause and give fresh sense about God. We might go to the Old Testament and take one of the Ten Commandments, the first one. You shall have no other gods before me. Now don't forget that me is spirit. You shall have no other gods but me. Let's take that word gods out and put in the word cause or causes. You shall have no other cause but me, spirit. Well, that's a quite interesting way to begin thinking about that very familiar first commandment. What happens if we go to the New Testament and take one of the foundational ideas out of that? Three words, God is love. Well, we take the word God out, we put cause in. Cause is love, or love is cause. Well, that's a very interesting way to start thinking about our life in the universe. What if you take these two ideas together and you say, you shall have no other causes but love, love is the only cause. Well, this begins to give us a sense of how God is operating. So let's talk about love being another way the Bible helps us think about God in a more expansive sense. Now, I definitely have heard philosophers today questioning whether love even exists. After all, you know, it's an invisible force. Most of us feel it has visible effect. In fact, I don't know too many people who would be willing to get up each day if they didn't have a sense of love in their life. So we're going to go with the more practical sense that love is real, and it's very much something we feel in our lives. Well, what happens now when we start asking what what comes out of that natural skepticism that Nietzsche had in the 1880s when he was writing these provocative ideas that God is dead. We can begin to see that maybe his sense of these views of God that had a man like God separate from us intervening in the laws of nature, yeah, maybe it's time for that view of God to be left behind. But on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, Nietzsche was writing in Germany, there was another writer, a woman, by the name of Mary Baker Eddy. And she was writing about new views of God based on very old ideas, but views that opened up a whole sense of healing that had been almost forgotten, almost left behind. Now Mary Baker Eddy grew up in New England. She was uh, on a family farm where they uh, had a very religious family, and uh, every day there was a new chapter of the Bible that was read, so she got to know the Bible pretty well. And prayer was very much part of the rhythm of the family. Like many of us, as we grow on into adulthood, we may take our sense of, of what we've found familiar and these ideas that we've grown up with, but we're challenged by them. And certainly Mary Baker Eddy had her fair share of challenges, losing loved ones at early ages, being a single mom, having chronic health issues that kept her in bed months at a time. 
In her mid-40s, after she'd been exploring all kinds of ways to address and alleviate the suffering she was going through, including forms of health care that are still popular today. She was exploring allopathic care. She was exploring homeopathic um, mind cure, often with a sense that these didn't, you know, they might bring a little bit of relief, but never permanent cure. Never a sense that her problems were really solved. In her mid-40s, she had an accident that left her with critical injuries that none of the health care of her day could reach. So she picked up that familiar Bible and went through some of the healings of Jesus' ministry. But she saw them in a new light at this moment of real need. And she recovered immediately from the effects of that, but she couldn't tell why this had happened. What was it she was looking at in the Bible that spoke to her as it hadn't before? So she spent the next three years of her life delving back into that familiar text, but looking at it from a fresh point of view. We have to think about the Bible was written in what you might call an age of faith. Back then, people observed things, but they didn't connect the dots as to why things might happen, what they meant. For example, if a lunar eclipse had happened back in Bible times, they certainly would have known something had happened to the moon. It would have probably been pretty alarming. Next night, the moon was way it should be, so they would write about this remarkable event. They couldn't tell why it had happened, when it might happen again, certainly what caused it. And yet, all these centuries later, as we begin to understand that things are not miraculous, but rest on law, we understand not only why, but when and where we can see a lunar eclipse. Same event, but two different perspectives. One that's limited by an age of faith alone. The other that's more expansive, that is taking with it a scientific approach, a sense of cause and effect that are reliable and understandable. So as Mary Baker Eddy was going back through the Bible in the sense of an age of science, of questioning, of being able to see the precepts that were timeless, applying back then, applying today. She began to find in the Bible expansive terms for God that were really relevant to our age today. And some of the others she found that were there all along but maybe overlooked as a man-like sense of God tended to overshadow things. She saw that God was truth. She saw that God was soul. Not a limited sense of soul that kind of is in each one of us, but more like spirit, that expansive sense of the source of all individuality, all identity, all, create, all that creative beauty and wholeness and health, that the soul that is the color of the universe was a way of understanding God, expressed throughout the universe. Wonderful, expansive sense. She kept going on. She saw that the word mind was another term for God. Mind being the intelligence, the wisdom, the discernment, the understanding. This all described God, again, Bible-based ideas, time-tested. She saw that God is truly the source and essence of life. Well, these six were pretty easy to see as they popped out of familiar verses, and yet seven is the number that often comes up in the Bible, is a sense of completeness. And as she continued to pray and listen and think and reflect, another theme of what described God came clear. It wasn't obvious in something like the King James Version, which never uses the word directly, but the idea was there. It was there in in verses like this one from James, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. That constancy, that sense of nothing varying is really the description for the word principle. And this was such a 
pure way of talking about God, God's nature. And this word principle really allows us to understand each of these other terms for God as being unchanging. It means that love never ebbs and flows, but is constant. That life is uninterrupted. That mind or intelligence is ever present. That soul, the source of health, is never limited. Principle defines all of these, and each of them is interchangeable. In fact, Mary Baker Eddy thought of these as seven synonyms for God. I like to think of them as sort of seven different doors in which you can go and begin to discover the essence of what God is. Certainly these aren't the only ways to think about God, but they are seven comprehensive ways that really everything else folds into nicely. If we were to think about God as a father and mother, well, isn't that love and maybe also life and intelligence for mind? All these things, shepherding, can be the truth and the love. I mean, all these things fold back into these seven comprehensive ways. I found that these ways of understanding God, again, Bible-based ways, are able to bridge the gap with some of my more skeptical friends. When I was in college, I used to have debates round and round with a good friend of mine who was a self-described atheist. He ended up becoming a paleontologist. Um, we were just great friends, and at a point in time when he was doing research at the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C., we were able to go down and visit him. And my son at that time was about four years old, and he just loved dinosaurs. We just, we had gotten every book out of the library on dinosaurs. He was correcting my pronunciation of them. You could just get this sense of just enthusiasm. So my friend Ken said, we'll come to the Smithsonian, and I'll give you a tour of all the ages of birds. So we did, and, and uh, at the end of our tour, my friend Ken turned to me and he said, it didn't matter what was going on on Earth. Life continued. And I said, why, Ken, you believe in God. And he kind of looked at me, had no idea what I was talking about. And I said, for me, God is a principle of life, always expressing itself. Well, that was the first time we had ever even gotten into a discussion of what God is. I had become familiar with these ideas about God, but he was still operating out of a traditional sense of a man like God. I had a similar experience when our family went down to the Galapagos Islands. And, uh, you know, this is the place where Darwin made all his observations about uh, evolution, and he wrote The Origin of Species, which tended to catapult this into the sense of science versus religion. Now, I don't see that as being an issue in the study of Christian science. And I had a conversation with one of the tour leaders who happened to be a university professor, an evolutionary biologist. And he was wondering how I, as a Christian, could feel comfortable on this tour. And I said, well, I'm, I'm having a great time. These, these animals are amazing. And it was something to be four feet away from an albatross with its chicks. Just wonderful sense of the beauty and richness of creation. Well, he asked me how I could feel about God. And... Uh, I told him my story about Ken, and uh, he had grown up in a, in a very conservative religious household, and he felt that his view of God from his conservative background was that God was mysterious, unknowable, could smite as well as bless. And he thought he had to make a choice between that God and the wonderful sense of order in his garden and in the forest beyond it. And he thought he had to make this choice between God or science. So I told him about my discussion with Ken and that I viewed God as this principle of life and love and intelligence. And he said, you know, if we redefine God, there doesn't need to be a schism between science and religion. Now again, what I was sharing were Bible-based ideas, but they were moving thought expansively into an age of science where we begin to understand God in a much wider way and realize that the healing that was going on in the ministry of Jesus and his students was not miraculous but resting on precepts or principles that are just as applicable today as they were back then.